course, because there is no more than I think the opportunity to be in your house again tonight, Lord, thank you for the salvations, Lord, tonight, uh, this afternoon. Pray, Lord, God, that you prepare everyone here as part, Lord, to hear the message preached, Lord, that you fill Pastor Baker with the Spirit, edify the saints, Lord, through the preaching of your word, and that everything will be done here, Lord, will glorify you. We pray that uh, you'll just bless the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And then, all right, this evening service is going to be a part two uh, along the lines of answering the atheist, on the subject of answering the atheist. Now, I want to begin this evening sermon with a quote from the most famous, the most prominent atheist. Yes. Richard Dawkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He revised, yeah, yeah. He revised his answer. Richard Dawkins. This is a quote from Richard Dawkins. <clears throat> he says, God, talking about the God of the Bible, God is the most unpleasant thing. He says thing, too. Kind of gives you an idea where he's coming from here. God is the most unpleasant thing humanity has plucked from fiction. God is unpleasant, homophobic, misogynistic, racist, genocidal, megalomaniac, mega, mega Low maniacal and sadomasochistic. And then he, I think he said being is the next part, but where I pulled this from it didn't have that. Being to exist, or being that has ever been you know, drawn up, or something along those lines. So that kind of gives you an idea where these atheists come from and some of the things that they will throw at the God of the Bible. You know, Jehovah, which ultimately was born in the flesh, Jesus Christ. You can just see that this man. Just, he's just oozing of hate for God. Right. He just hates the God of the Bible. And when it really comes down to it, it's that God disagrees with what he wants. It's that the Bible has a different point of view than what Richard Dawkins really desires for his life. And like we saw in 2 Peter chapter number 3 and, and Jude verses 17 and 18, it's because God gets in the way of them walking after their own ungodly lusts. I can guarantee you that Richard Dawkins is a very disgusting, perverted person. Richard Dawkins was actually interviewed about a, a uh, not necessarily a rape, but a molestation case that went on in a school that he attended as a child. A boarding school or some sort of some sort, some sort of a school in England, London, where he grew up, and there was some cases of molestation, and I, I believe that maybe Richard Dawkins actually, if anyone else remembers it, he himself said that he experienced molestation from this exact uh, teacher, and when he was asked about it, he said that he didn't think that it was that big of a deal. He said that he thought that it was pretty normal for the times that he grew up in. And that there wasn't that, you know, wasn't anything shocking or disturbing, that it, it didn't bother him and he turned out to be a normal guy. Well, if normal means being a God hater, then I guess you did turn out to be normal, you know, Richard Dawkins. Normal means having zero sense of, Im of, of morality, zero understanding of right and wrong and justice and un being someone being unjust, then maybe that is true, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, when you, when you hear him talk, every time he ever talks about God, he's almost like gritting, gritting his teeth. He hates God so much. And that's where all of these atheists come from. So I said all that again, and refreshed that, reviewed that again to say this when we get into the, this evening's uh, part two of the sermon. When we start looking at these claims, a lot of them are very, very easy to debunk because all you have to do is just read the context. Even in the context itself, like Job 39, you can find your answer. Now here in Deuteronomy chapter number 22 is found one of the, the famous texts that atheists like to attack or abuse. And atheists will bring up, you know, they'll say this, that the Bible teaches that if a man rapes a woman, if a man rapes a woman, the rape victim, the woman, is forced to marry the man. Who's heard that? Many people? Many, many people. Well, in the chapter that they will reference you, you can disprove and debunk that very, very clearly. It's so simple and it's, it's, it's such a foolish argument. First, I want to begin here in Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 28, the very end of the chapter. So it says this, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, saying she's not engaged, it's very similar to our word engaged, would be betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found, <coughs> then the man that lay with her 
shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and, and then it says this, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all, all his days. So they look at this passage, and they misunderstand a couple of words here. Notice, if you will, in verse number 28, one more time, it says, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and then it says this, and lay hold on her and lie with her. So they say, notice what he's doing here. He, he, he was laying hold on her, therefore he's raping her. Because what do you do when you rape somebody? You lay hold on them and you hold them down, right? That's what I've heard many of them say, right? Well, first I want to point out, even within this verse itself, you can about that. Because look at the last, what is that, four words. What does it say? Does it say, and he be found? What does it say? And they be found. What does it imply? That they're both guilty. Notice that. And they be found. But not only that, not only can you debunk it just from that, but like as I mentioned in the very beginning of this, you can look at the context. I want you to look at the context. Actually, skip up to verse number 25. Look up at verse number 25. Here is the, the example of a man raping a woman. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, now notice it sounds very similar, doesn't it? But then it says this, and the man force her and lie with her. Notice the big difference. The first one that we read down in verse number 28, it said that he lay hold on her and lie with her. What does it say here specifically? It says that he forces her and he and then at that point he lays with her. So it says this, it says that, he, uh, that the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. Notice the big difference in punishment and that's what really puts this to bed. Notice how just God truly is. That if the man comes in, the man sees a woman, the woman is rejecting and refusing his, you know, uh, his, his steps to advantage this. She you know, is rejecting it. Then he takes her and forces her. What does God say to do to this man? He needs to be put to death. Right. He needs to be killed. And that's what we should do today. Right. Man, when they go out, they were to see a woman, and they just grab the woman and force her and rape her. You know what should happen? They should be put to death. Amen. That's what we should do today. You know what? It's funny because all of these different atheists, they look at the Bible's you know, uh, punishments, the Bible's commandments. They try to mock God. And then they would probably say, no, that's inhumane. We shouldn't put him to death. It's like, what in the world? I thought you were sticking up for the rape victim here. Right. It's like, goodness sakes, you know, this is justice. That's what this is. You know why? It's because people nowadays, they look down upon virginity. They look down upon a woman being chased. They don't, not only do they not, not only do they look down upon it, men especially, you know, but in our society today, it's not uplifted, it's not exalted, and it's not something important. It's just, who cares, right? Who cares whether or not somebody's a virgin or not? Who cares? But you know, the Bible places a very high you know, price on a woman being a virgin when she's married. And that's very important. And God says, if you if you take, if you rape this woman and you take her virginity in this sense, in any sense, but if you if you rape a woman and force her, you're, you're to be put to death. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Right. Now notice the punishment is totally different, number one. Notice the wording is totally different, number two. It says that he's forcing her. The other one said that he lay a hold on her. You know, it's almost like the atheists, and I don't want to be graphic, but they've never engaged in that activity before, and they don't realize, lay hold on, that's something you can, it's impossible not to do if you're going to have relations between a man and a woman. That's all that it's saying, lay hold on. It's not, it's nothing dirty or anything like that, but it's obvious of what's going on. That's what that means. It's totally distinct and different than forcing. It's just holding on to, laying away, hold on. Exactly the same, right? Those two things are exactly the same. So the word is different. One says force, one says lie with. But the most important thing is that the punishment is totally different. The man only, it stresses that, the man only shall be put to death. And then what's to happen with the woman? Notice what it says afterwards because it says this. But under the damsel thou shalt do nothing. But under the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is, no, there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him... <coughs> Even so is this matter. Saying she's innocent and she couldn't do anything about it. So she's not to receive any punishment. She's totally to go free. God is a just God. Every time we search out these atheistic 
claims about the Bible or they're mocking the Bible, they end up being fools every single time. Just like the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, one of the, the statements that, that Richard Dawkins said was that God is, excuse me, misogynistic. And that's why I want to focus on it. That's why we started out here, right? They try to make it look like God is misogynistic. And that means that he hates women. So this is something they would bring up. And they would say, oh, well, men could just treat women however they wanted to in the Old Testament. Men could just, they mistreated women. But I'm going to show you that that's not the case. And there's a lot of things that are misrepresented about how women were carried themselves in the Old Testament. How, you know, uh, the different, uh, you know, uh, allowances that they had. Today, even you may not have noticed a couple of the things that we're going to look at this evening. I want you to turn over to Numbers chapter number 27, verse number 1. Numbers chapter number 27, verse number 1. Back one book. Numbers chapter number 27. Verse number one. <coughs> We're going to read the context and everything, so I won't. There'll be no need for an explanation. So begin here, verse number one. The Bible says this. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of the daughters: Mela, Noah, and Hogla, and Milcah, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest, and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. And then he says this, or she says this, the daughters, Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? Because he hath no son. So they don't have any brothers. Just these, these women just go... To you know uh, the, the leaders here before Moses and Eleazar, they're saying that their father he got he did he died in his own sin. He wasn't a part of the company that rebelled, right? He died in his own sin, and he doesn't have any sons. So what is it fair that his name would just be done away with? Look at verse number. Um, look at verse number four again. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he hath no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. Verse 5. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Watch this. The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. That of, uh, thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then he shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And I don't know if you ever paid attention to actually how this works here, but you can see the, the opposite of mistreatment to women. You can see in this particular situation, it's where there's a father. He has no sons, but he has these daughters, right? All the daughters go to uh, to the priest, to Moses, and they request, hey, you know, we you know, we don't want our father's name to be done away with, but it's not only that. Where would they live? Think about the possession being given elsewhere, being distributed maybe to uh, uh, the closest to Ken. Where are they gonna go, right? And notice when God responds, he says, the daughter the daughters of Zelophehad, that they spoke right. That what you should do if there aren't any signs you know who's next in line is the women should be issued that. Now, obviously, these are women that are not married. Let me say that as well. And this is the reason why everything ends up working out being perfectly fair. Number one, men are supposed to be the head of the household. That's not misogynistic, my friend. That's, just, that's what the Bible commands. And if you think that it's misogynistic, well, too bad. You just don't believe the Bible. I'm not going to sit here and just try to you know, convince so, you know, some hate God-hating atheist, right? But if you live your life where the man is not the head of the household, you will have a miserable marriage. Right. You have a miserable marriage. Somebody has to be the leader. You have one person. You can't, there's no such thing as a 50-50 relationship. It does not exist. Because you will not agree on every single thing in your life. You are with, between the husband and the wife. And what will happen when you come to you know, this split in the road, one person is going to get their way and the other person is not. And you know what's going to happen to the person that doesn't get their way? 
They're going to be angry. And it's not going to work out. And you wonder why all the every, the philosophy of the world today, the United States, is, hey, you should have a 50-50 relationship. When they have a 50% divorce rate. You know, if you have a 50-50 relationship, you got a 50% chance of a divorce in the United States today. Because that is what they put forth. You cannot have any sort of structured system. You know what? Families, that is a structured system. It really, if you live life together, there's decisions that need to be made. Therefore, there has to be an authority structure in that. You cannot have a structured system without having authority. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's silly. It's ridiculous. So when the men, they're given the land, right? And then they, if, if there was there were to be a son that was born to, of Zelophehad, he would be given the land. And you know what? Where his wife would inherit? With him. From another tribe, or they're supposed to marry within their tribe, but from another tribe family within his tribe, he would marry, and then his wife would come and live with him on that property. Well, in the case, or in the situation where there would not be a son, and the, and the, the, the daughter does not get married, well then that land just gets distributed and given directly to the daughter. If the daughter was to get married, then she obviously would go with her husband, and, and then inherit the property in which he was given. So notice how God's fair. So notice that women, you know, that is this something you think that an atheist would be aware of? That women own property under the nation of Israel. Think about that. Women were given the right and given the, the, the permission to own property and, be, and to be given their father's property if they were not married and if they lived, you know, at the time where they did not, that they had no brothers, if you will. Now I want you to look at this one more time. I want you to go over to something that's very similar to this. It's Numbers chapter number 36. <coughs> Numbers chapter number 36. Numbers chapter number 36. We'll get the context as well. Look at verse number 1. And the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spake before Moses and before the princes. The chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of, of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughter. So we just read about that, right? Look at verse 3. <clears throat> and if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. So it actually gets transferred because there's no one else to give it to in this case. So I misspoke a moment ago. That was incorrect. So they would just be transferred unto whatever tribe that they married unto if they married outside of their tribe. But look, that's not what I wanted to focus on here. Keep reading. Inheritance uh, be taken from the inheritance of our fathers. I'm oh, sorry, no, verse 3. Again, we'll begin from the beginning. And if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel... Then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe, whereunto they are received. So shall it be taken from the lot of our inheritance. Now look at verse 4. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be, then shall their inheritance be put unto the inheritance of the tribe, whereunto they are received. So shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Look at verse 5. And Moses commanded the children of Israel... According to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph hath said, Well, this is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Now I want you to pay close attention to this. Let them marry to whom they think best. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. Now, I don't know if you've ever read over this, if you've ever noticed it or not. It's obviously assumed, and we realize when we read the Bible as Christians, that of course, women in the Old Testament, just like today, they chose who they wanted to marry. They weren't forced, but the idea is purported a lot that the women in the Old Testament, the women in the New Testament, the women under the culture of the Middle East were what? They're forced to marry. They don't have the choice. And this is true today in Islamic countries. They will decide. They'll have a daughter that's 11, 12 years old. And they will literally give their daughter off for a prize, for a dowry, to some 35-year-old man. Obviously, that's disgusting in, in and of itself. But even sometimes, they'll have a 16 or 17-year-old daughter, an 18, 19-year-old daughter, that has zero choice in who she's marrying. But is that what the Bible teaches? Notice, notice the wording right there. I want you to look again at verse 6. Because this is important. And, and take note of where this is located. 
Because I've heard this numerous times from atheists, God anti atheists. You know, the Old Testament, they're forced to marry. You know, the God the God of the Bible is just misogynistic. You can rape women, nothing happens to the man. The woman's forced to marry him. The men just give off, you know, their, their daughters to anybody. Haven't you heard this kind of stuff? It's totally contrary to the Bible. Look again, verse 6. This is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best. So notice. They're choosing who they want to marry. They're deciding and choosing, I don't want to marry this guy. I want to marry this guy. They're deciding who is the best candidate for them. For them. Who they actually like, who they actually love, who they actually care about. Who they want to marry. They're choosing who they want to marry. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 31. Proverbs chapter number 31. Let's look at the example in the Bible of the, of the ideal woman of the virtuous woman. Let's read some of the characteristics of the virtuous woman. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 31, verse number, verse number 10. It begins, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rub rubies. Does that sound like God is talking down about a woman? No, it says her price is far above rubies. I don't remember reading anything about men in the Bible like that. Who can find a virtuous man? His price is far above rubies or gold or silver. Is there anything in the Bible you can think of like that? Not at all. But we do have in the Bible a chapter, you know, almost an, a, the, the entirety of a chapter dedicated to speaking about a virtuous woman and explaining to men, hey, if you can find a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies. This would be a great woman. The value that's placed on women in the Bible, that's what we actually see when we come to the Bible. Verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, <coughs> so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Does it sound like she's being oppressed and forced to do these things? It says she worketh willingly with her hands. <coughs> Verse 14, she is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planted the vineyard. Did you notice what it just said? It said, she considereth a field. So she looks at a field, and what does she do? She buys it, doesn't she? At her own volition, she sees this field, and she decides, I'm going to go purchase it. That would be perfect for a garden. That would be perfect for whatever she's doing with that. She decides that she wants to do that. Look at verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Now, does this sound like what is what is being promoted today of the of the, of a of what what the society would say is a virtuous woman in their eyes? Society of the feminist movement of what they would say a woman should be like? Does this sound at all like that? No, but, but when we read this and you look at this lady, what is she? She's super hardworking. She cares for her family. This is what women should seek to be. And they should not be deceived and fooled by the, what the world puts forth of how women should be. The, the world actually tries to make you masculine is what they try to do. They try to make you feel like, as women, that you're not good enough and in order to have value, you have to be a man. So what they're actually doing is they're making feminism of a lower value and saying, don't try to be feminine, don't try to be a lady, try to be a man because that's better. The feminist movement is actually what looks down upon being a woman, being a true woman. And actually being a woman of the Bible. And here's the thing, when you read it, does it sound like she's a weak woman? Does it, does it look like she's a weak woman? What does it say? I want you to look at verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arm. But let me ask you this also. Does, she, does it sound like she's a feminine woman? It does, doesn't it? So notice these two things are not just polar opposites. She's a hard worker. She's getting things done. She's taking care of her family. But she's a strong woman, isn't she? But she's also a feminine woman. Now, when you read through her, notice that she is in submission to her husband as well. Notice that he's trusting in her in this case. But she, what is she doing? She's actually, you know, making sure that she is being his caretaker. Keep reading. I want you to see her in just a moment. 
It says in verse 18, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. Now watch this. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. With scarlet. I'm sorry. Notice she, she is taking care of her family. Verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. That is the complete opposite of the women, the product of, of this feminist movement. Complete opposite. Look at verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household. Notice that. She's taking care of her family. She's a caretaker for her family. And eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. What a great woman, right? And all the women in here should strive to be a virtuous woman. There have, been many, there have been many women, I'm sure, throughout history that have been virtuous women. And actually, there's one woman that is named as a virtuous woman. Ruth. She's referred to as being a virtuous woman. And you know what she does? She's a hard worker. And if you want to find a good husband, all of the younger girls in here, not too many to, to preach to, but you know what? You know what you need to do? You need to strive to be a virtuous woman. I'm sure Ruth, after she married Boaz and years went by, I'm sure she was happy. But you know why she got a good husband like Boaz? Because she was a virtuous woman. And that's why. He was looking for a virtuous woman. He wasn't looking for a lazy woman. He was looking for a virtuous woman. And that was what you when he when he praises her, just like this says, you know, the, you know, that the man praises the woman. Before they were married, when he praises her, what does he what does he praise her about? He calls her the virtuous woman. And why? He's talking about her being a hard worker, and specifically he's talking about her trusting in the Lord. And what does it say here? Look at verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. And this is the summary of the virtuous woman. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So that's the most important thing about being a woman is fearing the Lord. That's the most important thing. The exact opposite. I, you know, I'm sure that this is Richard Dawkins' idea of, a, of, a, of a, you know, a, a wonderful woman, of a spectacular woman. No, he would mock at this. You know, and, and the, people look at the Bible and they say, oh, you know, the men mistreated the women so bad. Two times in this passage, it talks about the man praising the woman. It talks about the man telling the woman how great she's done. When you look at the relationship between Boaz and Ruth, how did Boaz treat Ruth? He's praising her, telling her she's a virtuous woman. You know, talking about the great things that she has done, right? That is actually the, the you know, looking through... You know, the light of truth, if you will, if you look at the Bible, that's actually the attitude of the men, and the attitude of the men and how they treat their wives in the Bible. Once you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25, look at a couple of passages real quick. And then I only have one other point tonight. I'll be done very shortly. Look at these, these passages very quickly. <coughs> Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 22 actually first. So this is something they would say, oh, this is misogynistic. Look at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So the Bible commands for the wife to submit unto her husband. And notice it says, as unto the Lord. The man is the boss. The man makes the decisions. When there's a decision to be made in the household, the man makes the decision. And the wife should just submit to her husband and allow him to make the decisions. That's what the Bible teaches, as unto the Lord. So how much are you submitted unto God? Is there any area of your life where you're not submitted unto God? Well, that's how you should be unto your husband. The only exception to that is if your husband were to try to provoke you in order to disobey God's commandments or disobey God's law. It's better, it, you know, we should, we should rather obey God than man, of course. But look here, verse number 23. Notice what it says. So the first commandment is for the wife, the wife to submit unto her husband. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the, the, the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands, and then it, it clarifies in everything. Now look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. What a misogynistic book, man. Husbands, love your wives. Now look at what it says next. Even as Christ also loved the church. And look what it says. And gave himself for it. So he's saying that's an example of how a man should love his wife. You think these atheists, and I can bring this up all day, their hypocrisy and the way in which they, they try to just you know, you know, talk bad about the Bible, the Bibles of misogynistic. Do you think they operate like this? Do you think that they have a higher standard for how a man should love his wife than the Bible? The Bible commands that a man should love his wife to the, to the point or to the extent of being willing to die for her. How much did Jesus love you? That's the question. He was willing to give his life for you, okay? Well, that's how much and the same way in which you should love your wife. I, I would like an atheist to give me a stronger example of love in which he bases his ideology of when, the way a husband should treat his wife. You think atheists say that? Husbands should be willing to die for their wives. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. They're, they're, you know, flipping and swapping wives all the time. They have no, no moral basis for anything. They don't care. Their life is all about them. That's the whole reason why in which, and we started the sermon on this, why they reject the God of the Bible in the first place. To be able to just go after their own ungodly lusts. And notice, the Bible commands for the husband to love the wife in the same way in which Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So it should be a self-sacrificing type of love. So those two things go hand in hand. The man being the boss should, the man being the boss should love his wife as Christ loved the church. The same way in which, you know, Christ loved me, right? That I, he is still my boss. Those two things go hand in hand just perfectly fine. No problems, no trouble at all. I want you to go over, we're just going to read this from Colossians 3.19. Go over to Colossians chapter 3, verse number 19. A couple pages over, actually. The Bible, Colossians 3, 19. This is repeated again. It gives you a little bit more details. It says this. <coughs> Husbands, love your wives. And it says, and be not bitter against them. So notice all these admonitions, the way in which to, to make sure that you're not mistreating your wife. Misogynism would be hating women, looking down upon women. But what does the Bible actually teach? No, you know, a, a virtuous woman, her price is far above ruby. She has a very high worth, a very high value, doesn't she? And husbands, when they're married, they should have a self-sacrificing love. Right here it tells you, husbands, love your wives, and then it tells you, it warns you, not to be bitter against them. I want you to turn to, this is the last thing we're going to look at. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 9, verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter number 9, verse number 5. We just have two verses we're going to look at real quickly. I'm going to look at this real fast, and tonight's sermon will be a little bit shorter. Uh, one thing that he brought up, and all atheists bring up, is, is genocide, right? Genocide. Talking about, you know, uh, uh, it, genocide actually means the destruction like of one specific race. Is, is this, and that's what that term actually means. Genocide is the destruction or, or killing off a race, killing everyone in a specific race. Well, that definitely can't be the Bible because the Bible never teaches one time that there are different races. The Bible is actually very clear that there are not different races. So that's debunked right from the start. Acts 17, 26 says this, talking about God, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have to determine the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. <clears throat> so, the Bible cannot, the God of the Bible cannot be, you know, uh, genocidal. Can he? Because the, because the God of the Bible says that all nations are of one blood, that there are not different ra races. All the nations are of one blood. We're all the same. The Bible says in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. Notice uh, another statement disproving you know, misogynism of the Bible. It says, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ 
is all and in all. Notice all these statements just saying it doesn't matter. And then in the Old Testament, I've quoted this a few times recently, but uh, Esther chapter number 8, verse number 17, even, even in the Old Testament, being a Jew was not of a race. It was a nation. It says this, And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And then it says this, And many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. You couldn't become a Jew if it was an, if it was an ethnicity. You could only do that if it was referring to a nationality. <clears throat> and then uh, Ezekiel 47:22. If you want to look that up, that just refers to a passage of how the uh, how the stranger would just inherit among Israel whatever tribe that he sealed sees fit. God does not see different races. The Bible is actually the book that records everyone going back to Noah. And, you know, it, it records everyone going back to Adam. You know, that's, that's a ridiculous claim or a ridiculous, uh, uh, you know, uh, accusation against the Bible. But here in, uh, in the Old Testament where you are, Deuteronomy chapter number 9, I want to look at something where, uh, where atheists will attack God very often. And they'll attack God specifically, and they'll say that he, you know, he was worthy of, or he was, uh, he committed genocide, genocide, when he went forth and just destroyed all the land, all the people of the Canaanites, right? That's always what's brought up. When they go into the land, just so that God could do the land to the Israelites, you know, they sent, you know, God sent the, the Israelites in there, and they just destroyed every man, woman, and child. They try to act like that this was, uh, this was an act of innocence. Right, that or an act of uh, where they were, these people were innocent, and that this was an act of murder, if you will. It wasn't just killing them; it was murder because these people were innocent. Well, let me say this: God sanctions killings all throughout the Bible. God sanctions the death penalty. That's a fact, and I have no problem with that. Most French Christians aren't willing to stand up for it. That's the first problem with Christians today: is that there are things in the Bible that embarrass them that they're scared of. No atheist is going to turn me to any passage in this book and make me blush. I've read it many, many times, and I love all of it. Amen. You want to read Leviticus to me? I'll go to, I, you, know, you can come and read it to me every night before I go to sleep, but I love it. Yeah. You know, I'm not ashamed of anything in this book at all. Period. I mean that. You know, so every, every time when God sent a nation, or the nation of Israel specifically, in to destroy a nation, I say that's just, and I say that's right. Anything that's in this book... I, I'm a fundamentalist, and I, you know, subscribe to that without any sort of embarrassment. I believe everything in this book, and if it's in this book, I believe it. This is my foundation and my starting point. I don't have a philosophy that I interpret this with. I interpret this and, and get my philosophy from here, and then I, I, I look at this and get my philosophy from here, and then interpret the world in light of this book. That's how it work, works, and that's how it should work for all Christians. But when they'll talk about how they went through and they, you know, they fought and they destroyed all the nations that dwell in Canaan. They'll talk about how they kill every man, woman, and child, right? And they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll try to fault God for that. Well, here's the thing. First, number one, this should be our, our first argument with them. We should explain to them, you know, like I just said, I'm not ashamed of what God did because I know that God's judgment is just. Number one. So whatever God did, it was just. And, you know, when you look in the Bible, the Bible actually tells you that the judgment that God executed upon them was just. I want you to look here in Deuteronomy chapter number 9. And I want you to look in verse number... <coughs> look at verse number 3. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God, He is He... I'm sorry. The Lord thy God is He which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, He shall destroy them. So God admits, hey, I'm the one destroying them. And he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Now look at verse 4. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. Now watch what it says. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out. Before thee. Now, so notice what the Bible actually teaches you and tells you. 
It wasn't just so that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, obviously they were dead at this time, but so that that promise could be fulfilled for them, or just so that Moses and the children of Israel could inherit that land. That was not the reason. It wasn't because the nation of Israel was so righteous. Why does God say that he destroyed all of those people? Because of their wickedness. And that's why God went through and God had them kill every man, woman, and child. And here's the thing that a lot of people will misunderstand about the Bible. They'll think, you know, they'll take some of the verses in the Bible that they're misconstruing about how one person, how a child cannot be punished for the father's sin. That's according to the law. There are many times in the Bible where a punishment gets just inherently passed down from the father to the child. Many, many times where people are taken, whole families are taken and punished because one person committed a sin. All of those children, this is how it works. There's no man that's not a sinner in the first place. And every person, even Noah, when the flood occurred, he deserved to die in the flood, but God showed him grace. You have to first understand that everyone is a sinner. Everyone. And if someone in there was a child, and they were not to the age of accountability yet, like the Bible teaches, Paul talks about that in Romans 7, the age of accountability, where he understood right from wrong. If there was a child there that did not understand right from wrong, and they ended up dying as a result of their parents' wickedness, you know where that child went when they died? To heaven. You can prove this backwards and forwards. David is a perfect example. When his child died as a baby, he says that, you know, that he that he's not going to be coming back to him, the child God, but David, when he dies, he'll go to the child. Where's David going, of course? To heaven. So at that time, he'll go and be with the child, saying that the child is in heaven at that point. <clears throat> so you can prove this in many, many different ways. But the age of accountability, the Bible teaches that if a child does not understand right from wrong yet, they are not, uh, you know, they're not accountable. That's why I refer to it as the age of accountability. They're not accountable or responsible for the sins that they have committed. But you know what? If someone had sinned, well, then they were punished for it. And you know what the Bible says that those nations, all those nations were? What does he say? Why did he destroy them? But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Why did they get to possess that land at that time? Because they were wicked. And actually, <clears throat> God tells Abram, you know, or he may have, his name actually at this point was changed to Abraham, because after the promise, of course, God tells Abraham that he had to wait because the sin had not come to its fullest yet. Its fullness. So God, notice God's righteous judgment. He's saying, I'm not going to go in there. Why? Because it would have been unrighteous for him at that point to go in and just destroy all the nations. Because he wasn't going to destroy them until they deserved it. And it goes through, I'm not going to turn there, just for sake of time tonight, the sermon was going to be a little bit shorter, because this morning was a little bit longer. But it goes through, uh, and I believe, in the book of Deuteronomy, all the lists of the sins that they had committed. And it's just the most disgusting, perverse sins, just total and absolute wickedness, just like God says. Don't stand, you know, don't try to stand in judgment of the Almighty God. Don't try to look at Him. You know, it, it's like, uh, I preached a sermon one time entitled, The God Pervert Judgment. You know why? Because it's a stupid statement for someone.